to this week's Money Metals podcast, helping gold and silver investors during these turbulent times. Now, this week's market wrap with commentary and analysis from Money Metals Exchange, the company named best overall precious metals dealer by Investopedia. Welcome to this week's Market Wrap podcast. I'm Mike Leeson. Coming up, we'll hear a tremendous interview with Chris Powell of the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, or GATA. Chris gives an explanation of why governments want to keep a lid on precious metals prices, how the weaponization of the dollar has become a very dangerous policy for the U.S. government, and also makes the case that the healthy rise in the price of gold over the past 25 years is a serious indictment against central banks and an indication of how efforts to limit gold's gains have been less and less successful. All of that and a whole lot more. So don't miss Mike Meharry's conversation with Chris Powell of GATA coming up after this week's market update. As the stock market starts off September with a sharp sell-off, gold and silver markets are showing relative strength. The S&P 500 has shed nearly 3% over the past few days on fears of a slowing economy. Gold, meanwhile, is holding steady near record highs. As of this Friday recording, the monetary metal trades at $2,497 an ounce and is down a slight 0.3% for the week. Silver, which was positive through Thursday's close, is taking it on the chin here today and now shows a weekly loss of 3.3% to bring spot prices to $27.94 per ounce. Platinum is off 0.7% at $927. And finally, palladium is off 3.4% this week to come in at $947 per ounce. Investors are reassessing their allocations as employment data continues to come in weaker than expected. Last month, the private sector added the fewest number of new workers in three and a half years. That comes after the July jobs number was revised significantly lower. Warnings by economists that a massive injection of government deficit spending into the economy would crowd out the private sector appear to be coming true. The Biden administration has so far managed to keep official unemployment and GDP statistics from fully reflecting weakness in the real economy. Transfer payments, combined with a massive federal hiring spree, have masked a decline in economic productivity. When the government spends money, it has to borrow into existence into the economy and employs more bureaucrats that functions as statistical stimulus. It doesn't matter whether those resources or those employees are being directed to productive endeavors. All that matters is that the money is being spent and the jobs are being created. The Internal Revenue Service is in the process of hiring tens of thousands of new agents. Thanks to the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, the IRS has been given a massive $80 billion funding boost. That's more than the entire GDP of Slovenia. A national fortune is being spent on tax auditing and enforcement at the federal level. And that doesn't even include the billions upon billions of dollars individuals and corporations must spend on tax compliance and accounting services. None of this activity creates new wealth. It all goes to facilitate the transfer of wealth to the government. Everyone from waitresses trying to get by on tips to small business owners and high net worth investors will be at heightened risk of being audited by a newly beefed up IRS. It's more important than ever for taxpayers to make sure their financial records are in order. It's also important for taxpayers to make sure they don't fork over more money to the IRS than they are legally required to. Many taxpayers overlook opportunities to save on what they will end up owing to the government. One way of reducing tax liability is to fully fund retirement accounts, including 401ks and IRAs. The upshot for precious metals investors is that they can hold many common types of physical bullion in tax-advantaged accounts. Not only can you purchase, hold, and sell real precious metals inside a tax-advantaged, self-directed precious metals IRA, but you can also withdraw your bullion and take direct physical possession of it under normal IRA distribution rules. The IRS does impose certain restrictions on size and purity, but a wide variety of bullion coins, rounds, and bars are eligible. In addition to gold and silver, you can even hold physical platinum and palladium within an IRA. To get started in funding a self-directed precious metals IRA, choose a reputable account trustee, then arrange for a bullion dealer such as Money Metals Exchange to ship your IRA-eligible bullion to your designated depository. Money Metals Depository is approved by many IRA trustees, such as New Direction and Mountain West. What if you have an existing IRA but don't want to make new cash contributions to fund a precious metals purchase? A conventional IRA, whether Roth or traditional, 
can be converted to a self-directed precious metals IRA, switching is easy. Most providers can enroll you right online and work directly with your existing IRA custodian to transfer funds. Your broker may have never told you about these fantastic options for obvious reasons, but they are totally legitimate. That said, as every individual's tax situation is unique, we urge clients to consult with their own tax advisor to determine their best course of action. Well now, without further delay, let's get right to this week's exclusive interview. Greetings, I'm Mike Meharry. I'm a reporter and analyst here at Money Metals, and I'm here today with Chris Powell. He is a political columnist, a longtime newspaper editor, and the co-founder of the Gold Antitrust Action League, uh, where he currently serves as the secretary and the treasurer. How are you doing today, Chris? Uh, very good to be with you, Mike. Well, I really appreciate you taking a little bit of time to chat. And I thought we'd kind of start out and talk a little bit about uh, Agata and the work that you guys are doing. And I want to start off this way. I think a lot of people, just your average guy on the street, if I go and say, uh, the the gold market is rigged, that there's price manipulation going on in the gold market. I think a lot of people kind of are skeptical of that, and they're going to say, oh, conspiracy theory. And I'm curious from, from your perspective, if you're talking to somebody, you've got just a quick time, what is the most compelling evidence that you would present to somebody to kind of show them the reality of, of what happens in these markets? Well, I would I would explain that you know, our work for you know more than twenty years has been to collect the documentation of gold market manipulation and and intervention. Um, if I was going to refer to a single document, I mean I, I have lots of favorites, but uh, uh, one that I think is uh, you know probably as compelling as any other is the speech that was given uh, by the head of the Monetary and Economic Department of the Bank for International Settlements, uh, William White, uh, back in, uh, oh, I don't know, 2010 or something. It's on our internet site. He was giving a speech to uh, a BIS conference uh, at the bank's headquarters in Basel, Switzerland. And he was talking about the uh, uh, the four or five uh, major purposes of international central bank uh, cooperation. And one of those uh, purposes uh, was uh, to influence asset prices, especially gold and foreign exchange, in circumstances where this might be felt useful. Now, you know, that's, it, that's on the record. That, that's yeah. what central banks do. Central banks uh, rig the gold price. Why do they rig the gold price? They rig the gold price to defend their own currencies. Because gold is the uh, uh, prospective alternative international reserve currency, and if gold ever gets out of the box, they're through. Yeah, and that and that was actually going to be my next question. What what's the motivation? And uh, I think you you sum that up perfectly. Uh, gold gold is real money, and it's a uh, a challenge to the paper fiat that. Uh, they can't seem to quit producing. I, I almost feel like I'm drowning in paper. In fact, I think Thomas Jefferson actually talked about being uh, being buried under a deluge of paper way back in the 1700s, 1800s. So, um, yeah. For- oh, it's money without counterparty risk, and it's money uh, that's very hard to devalue. Uh, well, uh, central banking is largely a, a matter of uh, of cheating the public through inflation. And if uh, if there's any escape uh, valve from that, escape hatch from that, any fire escape, people will take it. And gold is the fire escape. That's why they've always tried to uh, uh, control the gold price so it does not reflect the inflation that central banks are inflicting on the world. Do you think the kind of movement that we've seen, and it seems like to me that it's accelerated a little bit over the last uh, year or so, this kind of movement of gold from the West to the East, where we're seeing uh, a lot of demand for gold, not just from central banks, but also from individual investors, much more so in Asia, China, emerging market economies. Do you think that that the the central banking cartel in the West 
could be in danger of, of being kind of losing the control of, of what's going on. And, and do you kind of see this as, as maybe a political move from some of these Eastern countries to kind oh, of- Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think the, uh, the Western central banks uh, have already lost control of the gold price. Look, if, if they still had control of the gold price, it wouldn't be at $2,500 today. Mm-hmm. Uh, there would be a, a Louis d'Or would be the prize in every Cracker Jack box if central banks in the West <laughs> had their way. Uh, look, you know, since I got involved in uh, in this crazy business, uh, you know, gold has gone from two hundred and fifty dollars an ounce to twenty five hundred dollars an ounce, and you know, really just you know, twenty five years of my paying attention to it. Uh, that's you know, not something central banks are, are very happy about. Though I think in the end they may revalue gold. We'll talk about that just to. You know, when they think that's going to you know serve their their own purposes, but uh, uh, yeah, really the Western central banks here, I think, have have shot themselves in the f- foot. I mean, I would like for God to be able to take credit for raising the gold price from you know for, from ten times over the last you know twenty five years, but uh, uh, I think it is you know to a great extent a, a matter of the stupidity of uh, Western government policy and particularly U.S. government policy. Uh, uh, which has started to make other governments and central banks realize that, look, if uh, if the United States can confiscate uh, Russia's dollar-based assets, it can confiscate anybody. So uh, the uh, uh, security and safety of the dollar uh, have been destroyed, but have been destroyed by the U.S. government. Yeah, I've written quite a bit over the last year or so about the weaponization of the dollar, and uh, they put that into hyperdrive when. Russia invaded Ukraine. And, you know, I'm curious from your perspective, they, they have to know, I mean, right? Or is it just is it just a matter of arrogance that, oh, we can do this and, and we can get away with it? I mean, what's the mindset that says we're going to keep weaponizing our currency to our own detriment? Or do they really not see it as their detriment? I mean, what do you think? I, I think uh, in the end, that as the U.S. economist Paul Brodsky and Lee Quaintance wrote uh, a decade ago, I think there is a general understanding among central banks, coordinated through the BIS, that the gold price is going to have to be revalued, for, you know, for for a number of reasons. International politics is one of them. Uh, the the debt burden on government and society is is another one, um, but. I, I think all central banks uh, know this. They know it now. They might not have known it uh, 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm convinced that Gata was responsible for informing the Bank of Russia uh, about Western gold price suppression policy. The uh, deputy chairman of the Bank of Russia, Oleg Mazayskov, uh, gave a, uh, a speech to an LVMA conference in Moscow Oh, when was it? Uh, 15 years or so ago, in which the only words of English he spoke were gold antitrust action committee. <laughs> nice. I mean, to the best of my knowledge, up to that point, we had never had any contact with uh, anybody in Russia. Uh, his Mazayskov speech was an indication that, uh, uh, you know, quite to, to, uh, to our surprise, the Bank of Russia was paying very close attention uh, to our work. Uh, we know from the uh, WikiLeaks cables of uh, Bradley Manning uh, and, uh, you know, the guy who ran, ran WikiLeaks and has just been given a plea bargain, uh, that uh, China long has known about Western gold price suppression policy. The WikiLeaks cables are full of uh, Chinese news organization reports, reports from news organizations that are controlled by the Chinese government, uh, which uh, reported about gold market rigging by uh, the West and particularly by uh, the United States. Uh, Those cables, which WikiLeaks disclosed, uh, were sent from uh, the U.S. Embassy in Beijing to the State Department in Washington. Many cables talking about gold market manipulation by the West in order to support and sustain the, uh, the dollar. Well, the WikiLeaks cables show that not only has China known all about Western gold price suppression policy for years, 
But the U.S. government knows that China knows because the reports were cabled to the State Department. Uh, now, I, I've had uh, some face-to-face -face contact with some other central banks and some correspondence uh, with them. And while most of them don't want to have anything to do with me, uh, sure. I, I did get a couple of meetings with, uh, with central banks who dutifully uh, heard me out. And some central bank people around the world are on Gata's mailing list. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we have, uh, we, 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 we have informed, I think, a few people who wouldn't necessarily have known about it otherwise. But as a general matter, Mike, insofar as most major central banks are members of the bank for, for international settlements, and they, they have directors meetings every month uh, to which you and I are not invited, uh, I, I'm very confident that most of the central banks around the world are fully aware of Western central bank price suppression policy and that they are coordinating their their response to a change in this policy. Uh, did you see the uh, report? I think it came out of TASS uh, out of Russia that the uh, Russians are apparently planning on ramping up gold purchases here. In the yeah, starting market. tomorrow. Yeah. No, what do you make, no, what do you make is, of that? Uh, what do I make of it? What the hell took them so long? <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, you know, Russia is a commodity producing uh, country, has a lot of gold in, in, in the ground. Uh, uh, I think this should have been apparent to them long before they learned about it from us. I mean, certainly their their intelligence agencies are, are better than, uh, you know, than, than, than our work. But right. uh, it makes, you know, perfect sense. Uh, you know, gold in hand can't be sanctioned. Uh, you know, gold is the only uh, plausible alternative to the dollar as uh, as a reserve currency, as an alternate uh, reserve reserve currency. Um, yeah, the uh, uh, the Russians have finally figured this out. I look not not long after Gata had its uh, conference up in Dawson City in the Yukon back in what 2006, something something like that. We. We had a very prominent uh, Russian, supposedly a confidant of President Putin at that at that conference. Uh, he he told us that it was the greatest conference he ever attended. Hmm. And a few weeks later, uh, President Putin was photographed at a uh, uh, gold conference in the Russian Far East, holding a gold bar, and he was quoted as saying he had instructed the Bank of Russia to start buying gold on all markets. Um, you know, the, the world has figured this out. I mean, I, I despair of retail investors ever figuring this out in a, in, in a big way. And certainly I despair of, of uh, mainstream financial news organizations ever telling the truth about gold and about uh, market rigging. But uh, all the major, and I think some of the minor central bank uh, banks around the world know, and I think they are preparing a world in which... Uh, uh, gold is the reserve currency, the once and future money. Yeah, I, I was I was kind of going to ask you about that if you thought that because there's a lot of proposals that seem to be floating out there about competing uh, currencies. You've got the uh, you know cryptocurrencies. You've got the um, uh, Zimbabwe. They've got their Zig now, which is a kind of a gold backed currency. You've got. Bricks talking about a, a currency. You, you think do, uh, the gold is is what's ultimately going to uh, win the day? Well, you know, what else are you going to use? I mean, if, if people, uh, you know, want to uh, believe in cryptocurrency, I, I I welcome anybody who wants to get into the currency business. Uh, you know, let uh, let, let con currencies compete. Uh, that's you know really the the fair and democratic thing to do. I I do not have much. Uh, faith in crypto. I mean, I have to rely on uh, on somebody to tell me that the crypto program really does what everybody says it does. How do right. I know that? I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, crypto is a is a phantom to you know to me. Maybe it'll work. Or maybe it uh, it won't work. But uh, you know, gold is uh, is tangible. Right. If if you're holding it, you're holding it. Uh, yeah. You don't have to understand any computer programs or or anything like that. It it it's been money for. Thousands of, of years because it, you know met of all of Aristotle's uh, uh, prerequisites for 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 money. Uh, it's uh, it's money today because it uh, 
uh, it has no counterparty risk when you're you know holding it your, yourself, and it's it's accepted everywhere. As, he, as even uh, uh, Alan Green, Greenspan said, it's it's yeah. better than an American Express card. Right. Uh, so what else are you going to go to? Uh, I, I I can't see them uh, resorting to anything else but uh, but gold. It has universal recognition as money. It's real. Uh, it's not going to disappear when you know the power goes out or the internet service is, is cut off. Now, if you if you have uh, more faith in something else, good luck to you. Yeah, I agree with you completely. I'm a I'm a big fan of uh, let the market sort it out, uh, but I, I'm inclined to agree with you as well. Adam Goplinski, and I'm probably just butchered his name, but he's the uh, governor of the Central Bank of Poland. Uh, had a, a great quote. This was a couple of years ago, and incidentally, Poland, for folks who don't know, has been one of the uh, biggest central bank gold buyers this year. And uh, he said basically exactly what you said about the fact that it is the one thing that we can hold on to that nobody can turn it off, right? Uh, there's no switch that can be flipped. There's no uh, you know, electronic thing that can happen that can wipe it out. It is a tangible, physical thing. And that's exactly why Poland is is seeking to, uh, at least according to their public plans, increase their reserves to at least 20 percent of gold. So, um, Yeah, well, J.P. Morgan said that uh, gold is money and everything else is credit. And uh, if if he meant by that everything else is counterparty risk, I'd go along with them completely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And for folks who may be don't know what counterparty risk it, it's basically just the fact that on on most assets somebody is standing on the other side that could conceivably default um, or or uh, you know make it go bad and, and gold doesn't it, it is what it is um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about an article that you wrote that we published over at uh, moneymetals.com slash news and uh, you talked about the uh, it was actually in context of this uh, trillion dollar coin, which is an idea that seems to not ever want to go away. Uh, but you pointed out that it's feasible to do exactly the same thing by revaluating gold. And it's something that uh, you've already mentioned in the course of our conversation. And in that article, you pointed out that there actually is already a, a, a kind of a process in place at the Treasury to make this happen. Can you kind of explain to folks what, first off, what is gold revaluation and what would it do? And, and second off, uh, how could it be done conceivably? Um, one of my favorite documents, uh, which I think was uh, discovered, uh, well, it was either by Ronan Manley or Jan Niewenhuis uh, some years ago, uh, uh, is the uh, transcript of a conversation in uh, U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger's office in April 1974 with his uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary Thomas Owenders. Uh, in which Andrews is explaining to Kissinger why the uh, the U.S. must uh, keep its European allies from remonetizing gold or giving gold any more of a of a role in the world financial system. Uh, Andrews is telling Kissinger that the Europeans now have more gold than the United States does. Collectively, they had more gold than the United States did, and that uh, uh, whoever has the most gold, uh, has the power to revalue it from time to time, uh, and thereby change all asset and currency valuations in the world. Enders told Kissinger that gold is what he called the reserve creating instrument. If you can assign gold's value, uh, you can create more money reserves for yourself, you can change the value of all currencies and assets and goods and services in the world if you control the gold price. Hence, Enders told Kissinger, we can't let the Europeans control the gold price. We have to control the gold price uh, in order that you know, we can control uh, the value of the dollar and, and the value of, of everything else. That's the point. Gold is the great reserve creating instrument. Right. You can assign values to it and thereby create money if you want. I mean, the United States, you know, could do this now. We we technically, uh, the Treasury technically devalues uh, our gold at $42.22, you know, per ounce for all those 8,133 tons we supposedly still have uh, possession of. 
Um, if uh, the United States wanted to change the valuation of, uh, of that gold, it could just change the valuation of it uh, and, uh, uh, you know, give uh, orders to the, uh, the Federal Reserve that the uh, gold certificates you now hold are now worth, you know, trillions and trillions more than you're carrying them on the book, books. Uh, please credit the, uh, the gain to our account and uh, issue, uh, you know, a lot of currency against that, uh, that gold. It's the reserve creating instrument. It's, it's an accounting mechanism by which you can, you can create money. That was uh, what was the uh, behind the platinum coin idea that they they wanted to use the uh, obscure law about uh, uh, the Treasury's authority to mint platinum coins in any denomination. Um, well, that was thought to be a, a, a thing for collectors, <laughs> but they looked at the law carefully a few years ago and realized, wait a minute, you, you could you could make any de denomination of a platinum coin. Well. You could tell the Treasury uh, to have them in, make a trillion dollar coin, deposit that trillion dollar coin over at the Fed and tell them we want to cash this coin. Yeah. And the, the Fed would create a trillion dollars uh, you know, or 10 trillion, however you wanted to denominate uh, the coin. The, the, uh, the benefit to the United States of using uh, a platinum coin for reserve creation rather than gold is that the, the platinum coin uh, with a high denomination deposited at the Fed would, would create reserves only for the United States. But if you revalue gold, every nation in the world uh, that has a gold reserve, if the gold is to be revalued upward, is going to benefit from that revaluation. Right. And uh, uh, the revaluation of gold suddenly would be more democratic. Uh, that's why I think certain elements in the United States would much prefer the platinum coin uh, denomination of you know a trillion dollars rather than a gold revaluation because then the United States would you know would get all the reserve creation. Right, right. Isn't that that's effectively what Franklin D. Roosevelt did back in the 1930s, right? I mean, he tried to get more gold by taking it from the public, and then he simply valued it higher and. In effect, created a bunch of. Currency. Oh, you you wrote the definitive essay on that the other day, didn't you? That uh, the reason Roosevelt did that was because the law at the time uh, required a uh, what forty percent gold backing for right. for the dollar, and right. Roosevelt was sitting in the middle of a catastrophic deflation. He wanted, and I think rightly, he wanted more money circulating in the economy. But he, he under the law, he couldn't create it unless the uh, the treasury had uh, had more gold reserves. Right. Uh, that's why Roosevelt wanted the gold. He wanted the gold to uh, to put it uh, into the government so that the government could create more money uh, against it. Again, gold in that circumstance was the reserve creating instrument. Mm -hmm. I think people don't understand or most people out there don't understand the fact that central banking and their ability to create money. I call it the engine that drives the uh, the biggest government in the history of the world. If it wasn't able to create money out of thin air, if it was really e even restrained, much less actually having you know where gold actually is money, there's no way that they could borrow and and spend to the extent that it does. And without the ability to borrow and spend, that takes power away from politicians. And I think really that's if you want to get into the psychology of the of the whole thing. That's it right there. It's it's a matter of power. I mean, you, you can yes, literally infinite say money is power. infinite. Infinite money is infinite power. Uh, and you don't want that floating around, for God's sake. That's the <laughs> that's the end of humanity. It's the end of uh, it's the end of democracy. Uh, but, you know, I, I would never say that central banks are are creating money out of nothing. Uh, you know, every currency is backed by something. It's it's it's, it's backed first by the the economic production of right. the country that's issuing the money. And secondly, it's uh, it's backed by the tax power of the government issuing that money. Uh, it was a great essay. Uh, I forget the guy's name uh, right now, but I can look it up uh, back in the uh, in, in the 40s. Uh, the, the essay was titled, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, Taxation for Revenue is uh, Obsolete. Uh, it was uh, written by the president of the New York Fed at the, uh, the mm. time, uh, and he was explaining that uh, 
modern governments, when you're relieved of a commodity standard for your money, if you're not on a gold standard anymore, if there's no fixed rate of convertibility uh, from uh, your currency into gold, uh, they can create as much money as they want. And they, they, they don't tax because they need revenue. They can just print it up. They can right. type it in. Uh, they tax to give value to their currency. Uh, they, they tax to create demand for their currency. If uh, you didn't have to pay your taxes in dollars, uh, well, people might start using almost anything else uh, for money, especially if the dollar was being inflated away. Right. So, you know, fiat currencies do have some backing. They have the economic production of the country, uh, you know, whose goods and services are purchasable uh, in uh, that currency, and, and they have the tax power, which uh, is, is backing. But uh, uh, <laughs> they don't have enough goods and services and production and tax power to support all the money they've been issuing in the last few years, at least not, not without running the currency down to zero. Right, exactly. And that, I'll, I'll wrap up on this, and this is a little bit of speculation. Well, no, it's a lot of speculation. But, you know, obviously we've seen uh, situations in history. Zimbabwe comes to mind. Uh, we've seen it in Venezuela where you have hyperinflation, where the the currency just completely collapses. And sometimes you'll hear people say, you know, well, that could happen here in the United States. Do you think that the government or any major Western government is in danger of overplaying its hand and in, in collapsing its currency? Or is that kind of something that's uh, maybe a scare tactic? Well, I, I think we've, uh, we're on that very brink right, right now, Mike. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, well, I did a little calculation the other day uh, uh, that uh, the United States is spending, I believe, 27% more money that it's, than it's taking in in tax revenue. Now, you can get away with that for, for a while, but uh, we are living off uh, the rest of the world because we were relying on the rest of the world to, you know, to, buy, to lend us money. And uh, uh, the rest of the world is beginning to wake up that that's not such a good bet, that the, the dollar is being uh, devalued by, by inflation. So why are we buying, you know, long dated U.S. government bonds uh, if uh, the rest of the world ever decided, no, we, we don't want to buy your bonds anymore? Uh, and uh, all of a sudden the U.S. bond market crashed, well, the dollar would, would crash soon afterwards. Uh, so I, I think we're at the, that, uh, that point already. We have alienated much of the rest of the world, and we're living off the rest of the world uh, borrowing its money. Yeah. Uh, that's one thing that Mazeskoff in his speech 15, 20 years ago uh, said. He noted the irony of the, the richest country in the world, the United States, living off borrowing uh, from poorer countries. It's, yeah. that, that was a moral wrong. And, and you know, here, here's a Russian telling us about a moral wrong. And he was absolutely right. We think of ourselves as the good guys. We're, we're exploiting the rest of the world, especially uh, the poor countries. Yeah. I saw today along those lines that the uh, U.S. trade deficit was, a, <clears throat> excuse me, at the highest level since uh, May 2022. So we're giving them dollars and we're taking their stuff. Yeah, we, you know, we, we get, uh, you know, oil and electronics and commodities from them, and we pay them in colored paper and electrons. Yeah. <laughs> it's a nice racket while it lasts. I was going to say it's a good gig if you can get it. Unfortunately, we can't do that. We'll end up in prison. Um, so before we wrap up, why don't you let people know how they can uh, follow the work that you're doing over at GATA and, uh, and, and get the uh, information that you're handing out and – one thing I would highly recommend, folks, just get on your email list and uh, and get your emails because you you guys send out a lot of great information uh, that not necessarily out there on CNBC or Fox Business. But how can people follow what you're doing? Oh, well, thank you, Mike. Uh, yeah, our Internet site is GATA.org. Uh, we have a, a daily newsletter. Uh, sometimes I'll send out several dispatches a day. There's some days we don't really have much to say, but... Our, uh, our dispatch, getting our, on our dispatch list is free. You can sign up for our, our dispatches uh, in the, uh, with the mechanism of the top, top right column of, our, uh, of our, our Internet site. You can subscribe to 
uh, the, the daily dispatches to get all of them at once. You can subscribe to a summary di dispatch so your email box doesn't get uh, quite as cluttered. Uh, and we're a, uh, a, a nonprofit educational and civil rights organization. We're uh, uh, recognized as tax exempt by the U.S. Internal Revenue Service for a 501c3 organization. We uh, uh, we survive off uh, contributions from anybody who who cares to uh, support us. Uh, we have uh, a little support from the mining industry, though I think 99% of the mining industry is brain dead. Doesn't have any idea that it's <laughs> it's in the money business. I know uh, it's not... they're digging money out of the ground and then they sell it for a fiat. Yeah, well, I, I've lost that battle. They they're, they're never going to understand that, yeah. but we. We do uh, seek contributions from uh, from anybody who wants to uh, uh, help uh, the the struggle for transparency and limited government and sound money and and all that. Uh, uh, we we welcome checks uh, payable to GATA uh, sent to our corporate address uh, here in Manchester, Connecticut. And uh, uh, if it really wasn't for People who, I guess, they're uh, they're dreamers like us. Uh, we we wouldn't be here, but uh, we we survive on uh, on on generous donations from the public, and I think we could use some more today. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I I, I want to reiterate something that you just mentioned. If you are a person who cares about limited government, if that's a thing, and uh, you know that's that's important to you. I would argue that you're probably not going to get that by voting for, you know, the the next great president or whatever. I think limited government is really going to come through reforming the, this monetary system because, again, that's the the rocket fuel that makes the whole thing go. So, if you're no, a limited you government, limited person, go you can't have limited government without limited money. Infinite money is infinite government, perfect, and that's uh, that's the road uh, to hell. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great quote. I want to I'm going to write that one down and keep it. Well, I appreciate you taking the, the time out of your day and uh, appreciate your insights. And we'll definitely have you back on uh, again as we move on. And, and we'll try to keep people informed and make people more informed. Thanks for your work, too, Mike. Thank you. Bye bye. You can't have limited government without limited money. Infinite money is infinite government. And that's the road to hell. A profound quote by our good friend Chris Powell right there, and that's a great way to put a bow on this week's podcast. And I sure hope you will consider supporting GATA as we do here at Money Metals. We think it's important that Chris and his team have the resources to continue their important work. If you can help, please go to their website by typing gata.org. Well, that will do it for this week. Be sure to check back next Friday for our next weekly market wrap podcast. Tune in as well to the Money Metals Midweek Memo, hosted by Mike Meharry and airing each Wednesday. To listen to any of our audio programs, just go to moneymetals.com forward slash podcasts or find that on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Until next time, this has been Mike Leeson with the Money Metals Exchange. Thanks for listening and have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this week's Money Metals podcast. Be sure to come back next week and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes. For answers to all of your questions, or to discreetly and securely buy or sell gold or silver coins, bars, and rounds, call 1-800-800-1865 or visit www.moneymetals.com. Our knowledgeable and no-pressure specialists are standing by to answer your call during business hours, Monday through Saturday. Or you can lock in your order online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Again, visit us at www.moneymetals.com or call 1-800-800-1865.